record to the cloud. There you go. Next time, I need to set it up such that I don't have to remember. Okay. Um, and uh, so then the office hours will be on Zoom uh, because I think it's actually better. There are certain things that we figured out over the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, some things work well in face-to-face. In, in -face. Some things are probably more convenient anyway um, on Zoom. So you don't have to come all the way to my office. I'm set up a Zoom account, and then you can just log in here and talk. OK? Uh, that's what I'm going to set up that. Uh, and how many of you know that there's a Piazza account for this? OK. The others, you're clueless. Please get clue, OK? Because I've been sending messages on Piazza already. Half of the course is over. Most of these people who know about uh, the Piazza already got their grades. Um, anyway, so there is a Piazza, and that's where I'll be putting everything. Um, so as far as the course support staff is concerned, um, yeah, I'll tell you in a, in a minute, but essentially the department gives like a grader for this course. I have to figure out who that grader is, but since I'm running it, I have my PhD students, so I just lean on them. Uh, I have two uh, guys, uh, Siddhant Bhambri, who is right here, and uh, uh, Kartik Valmekam, who is actually not here, but will be there starting, I guess, will be there um, next time onwards. Um, they may or may not be in the class, but certainly, uh, you know, he has, Kartik actually has taken this course in fall 2019 when I gave this, so he knows what all the Okay, um, and then, uh, and then, the other thing I'll say is that, I mean, I have a whole bunch of uh, grad students and, you know, we can call in more people to help. You know, lack of help is not going to be your problem. Lack of time and the craziness of actually trying to have a life other than a class might be a problem. Okay. But lack of help is not going to be a problem. Uh, so the next book is going to be Russell and Narvi, uh fourth edition. Um, that's out now, but the third edition is sort of acceptable. Uh, you know, you have to, if I basically, I will, if I wind up doing anything directly from there, I will let you know from the fourth edition, but I will be doing it the fourth edition. Okay. And then I told you there's a Piazza account, and you should be familiar with that. Okay. This, I don't know why this is called. This is kind of unfortunate. Okay. Um, like I said, I have a whole bunch of students. There are like this guy and this guy are the front men, quote unquote, for the class. They will help you. They are actually kind of, you know, I ask them to help the semester. Um, the others are happy to help as needed, so we will bring in other people as needed. But, you know, so there is no question of worrying about that. Um, okay, so about this course, as I said, this is another section. This, there is another 471. That's available. I hope you all know that. Okay, you could take that. Um, I'm assuming that you took this for whatever reason, knowing the difference between the two sections that I uh, mentioned. Um, so, uh, how many of you know Seinfeld? Okay, I know you're young, but you know, that's one of the best shows that you should watch. And in fact, you know, when you're not doing homework for this class, watch Seinfeld, then you will enjoy my class much better. Okay. Um, anyway, so those of you who know Seinfeld, there is a there's, a, uh, there's an episode where Kramer basically adopts a part of the highway. And once he adopts the highway, he decides he'll make his part of the highway the nicest highway possible. So what does he do? He makes the lanes go away by making wide lanes. Okay. And so, in fact, there's this part where Elaine gets onto the, wow, what a nice lane, etc. And she's having a lot of fun. In a weird way, that's what I'm doing with this class. Okay. You know, you know, you're not born yesterday. You know that computer science classes are not supposed to have that issue, right? Even if you pay $60,000 tuition, the Stanford's of the world say, our machine learning class only has 1,200 people, as if that's like a good thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? The other 471 that's going on here has 130 people. The other 571 has 150 people or 130 people. Okay, so the entire world is going in large classes, MOOCs and all that fun stuff. So we try to buck the trend, okay? Uh, so we're just going to have it only for like the 30 or whoever still stay uh, after the drop end, okay? 
Um, so what are the pros? The pros is, this is probably the only class where you actually social distance, if you prefer to, okay? And furthermore, you might very well know everybody else's name, and I will certainly know your name. 30 people I can figure out. I mean, I'm old, I don't have as good a memory, but 30 people's names I remember. Um, but I also know that this is an honors class, and basically, supposedly, valid students are this creme de la creme. Uh, that's what I'm told, so I'm going to find out. Okay, so I don't need to feel bad about being very demanding, because I'm assuming that you are bored in all the other classes, because this is too easy. So we will rectify that in this class. Okay, uh, so the pros is that I know all your names and faces, and I know that you are good, supposedly. Uh, the cons is in the pros. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it may very well be that it's easier to act as if, oh my God, you're not being challenged while getting your A pluses in classes full of 10,000 people. Okay? Here's your chance where you can actually see whether you're as good as you thought you were. You know, in terms of, I mean, not forget about you as good. I mean, if you really felt that you're not being challenged, hopefully we'll do that here. Okay? That's basically the deal. Um, Okay, and, and as I said, this, if I open the doors, this room will be full. I just basically, I'm only keeping it for honor students, um, you know, undergrad honor students, that's it. And I, this, is my 30, this is my 31st year of teaching. 30 years I've been teaching here. So I have to wait 30 years to pull in this year. Do you understand what I'm saying? If everybody gets to adopt a highway and make it wide, all the highways will be wide with just one lane. But you know you have to wait for a long time. But so I got to do this this time. Uh, so we'll see how this experiment goes. Um, okay. So the grading, etc. Um, basically, these things might change a little bit. But the projects will be about forty percent. There'll be four plus projects, um, and then the search and, and the, I mean, the, the names may not make sense to you, but there are about four plus projects. They will be programming in Python. They'll be based on Berkeley, Pac-Man projects with some variations, you'll see that later. Um, homeworks and class quizzes and participation um, um, is about 25%. Okay, and then uh, exams is about 35%. The exams will be midterm and a final, which may well be a take home. Okay, um, it, both of them might be a take home. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. This is supposed to be an honor section. So I should be able to believe that you have an honor code. If I can't believe in this section that people are honor code, where else can I? Okay. So my assumption would be that I'll give you the benefit of doubt that you would do things according to rules in terms of you know collaboration, etc. And I won't be looking over your shoulder, and so I would feel comfortable in giving take home, you know, giving high weightage to take home. You must have seen in many classes these days the work that you do at home is becoming what less and less and less. Because there's no easy way of making sure that we know that people are not cheating. So this is a small enough class. I can stare at your face. Uh, and so I'm hoping that you are not going to try and take advantage. And so we will assume that you are just going to do things right. And so I will assume that you're honorable. And so we can have a class with basically more flexibility. Okay. So I, that can include, I you know, uh, Okay, participation and preparation, attendance to and attentiveness in the class is mandatory. Um, participation in PR size, highly encouraged. You can learn a lot by essentially taking part on PR discussions and asking questions. I mean, you can teach each other. And all my grad students will be spectators there. So if there's a question, whether it's kind of the project, or whether it's kind of the general AI stuff, you can ask there and you will get it. I spent about one and a half hours yesterday. So that, uh, except, and then so I only needed to come 20 minutes before the class so that everything was right, but I can find it. Um, anyway, I need to again put this 
Okay. Um, so our lectures will be recorded and put on YouTube and Zoom after the class, but this is not an excuse for you for you to skip the class. I mean, I've been recording my classes since like since recording devices have been invented, more or less. I mean, I had recorded at one point of time just the audio and the slides. Then I recorded the video. Then I started putting them on the YouTube. I have classes recorded from at least 2011. Okay. And the point is that you can watch them afterwards. But I'm extremely picky about you being in the class. If I'm in the class, you're in the class. That's the deal. Okay. This is for you to watch later on if you need. That's why I'm not going to give you the Zoom account later right now. Um, but they will be available. So if you miss something, you want to go back, get it. You can always do that. Uh, the class schedule, approximately last time around, was this. This is available from that link, uh, the honor section link that I gave you. Um, and that has a bunch of information, including the videos from the last year's classes. And one of the things that I would like to figure out as we go along is whether it might make sense, depending on how adventurous you are, depending on how participatory you are, okay, it, whether it might make sense to have you look at some lectures beforehand so that we can have more discussion here, as again as me repeating the same thing. I will be here every day. I mean, I'll be here. If, uh, the, the days of the week that the class is. Uh, but I'm just trying to see you know, what we can do with this uh, opportunity. Uh, but that will figure that out slowly. Okay, so that's the class thing. Um, the Piazza, when I run this class, the last time I ran it was 2019, and that had, I think, 100 and some people um, in the class. It started by Chai, but you know, it was 100 some people at the end. Um, and they were you know, very uh, participatory. I mean, so you can see. Like the basically, there are two cups here. How many of you have used Piazza before? Okay. So I'm actually paying for you guys this time because the Piazza is no longer free. Okay. So I'm paying $500 just so that um, we'll have all the belts that I've used. So I don't want to go back into Canvas or something. I know this. Um, so you just see that there are about 3,442 contributions at Piazza. You know. And of which probably I wrote a huge number of them. I, at least in terms of posting, I would be one of the higher ones. But lots and lots of people were posting questions and, and also asking each other. So you can learn a lot more this way also. No, it's, a, it's a very So keep that in mind. Uh, post demands your undivided attention. And uh, it's, I've been already been. People always complain. I'm sure they do it to other courses too. That that this is really a four to five credit class that I'm getting only three credits for. But I'm not. I don't normally worry about those complaints. I certainly won't worry this time because you're honor students and you're actually also getting honors footnote credit free just by being in this class. You know, uh, basically you don't need to do anything separate. You will get that as part of it. Okay. Uh, furthermore, it is an experiment. You can see whether you actually like small classes or, that, you know, or whether you are much happier in a huge, large class where nobody will know whether you are there or not. Which is what you get to have anyway in all your classes. Okay. So, a couple of rules. Uh, the new rule is that you should be inhaling air, yeah, you shouldn't be exhaling at all most of the time. Once in a while, at about 25 minutes' time, you can exhale. Okay, so that we'll not have any problems with the Delta virus. Is that okay with you guys? I think I can ask pretty much anything in this crowd. Anyway, clearly that's not okay. <laughs> Obviously, I'm making this up, but uh, you can excel. Um, but this is the uh, university policy, um, which basically requires, and I see a lot of you are wearing anyway. I'm not a policeman here. I'm not going to, I'm not standing here to enforce university policies. But that's a university policy that we are all supposed to be following. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so like our head, I am like our head. There is no post. Uh, no, what uh, the heck? Oh, I'm sorry. You are saying. Okay. No, okay. there is no try. And similarly, for this sorry. course, like our head, there is no posting through the course. 
Currently, I require. If you myself. want a course that you can post through, find some other course. Seriously. Okay, Vikal. <laughs> I'm going to spend a lot of time. You're going to spend a lot of time. You will learn whether you want it or not. And it's very hard to post when you are learning. Uh, you will wind up spending a lot of time. Okay. Uh, I will make the assumption that you are taking this course because you really, 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 really want to figure out. It. Okay. So you got it. Okay. So it turns out that apparently the last time I used this slide, I record it, and the slide recording comes with a little speaker, and I forgot to remove it. Everything else also had that, but you know this one I forgot to remove. Again, remind us, stating that point, in general, I mean, I basically asked for this course, and I had to move mountains to just get this course. Okay, so I'm interested in teaching it. Um, so take it only if you're really interested. Okay, I mean, you know, that's basically my assumption is that if you're continuing in the class, you're very interested in the subject, you're interested in trying to get a small class experience, um, and you know, a limited amount of help, but no dilution. Okay, that's the deal. So, but having said that, you might be wondering what will happen to my grades. Don't worry about your grades. Okay, I'm not really, I don't really care about ruining your GPA. I care about making your life during this semester hard. That's all. Okay, so as long as you have, you felt, you know, that you were challenged, that, that was a demanding semester, that would be fine. If required, if everybody does well, all of them get A's, I don't care. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So don't assume just because you are not at 95 plus. Um, so I mean, there are two ways of running courses. One, one way is make everything easy and try to split hairs between 95 and 97 out of 100. My course is mostly nobody ever gets 98. That's okay. You know, someone saying there may be somebody who understands a lot more than others. And it's worth for me to know that. Because that's what makes me interested in teaching. But just because you don't get a 90 doesn't mean you won't get any. Do you understand that? I say this because this is something that seems to be a big deal for students, and they get very worried about this. So I'm not going to repeat this, but you can probably take a picture of it and keep looking at it, you know, if you can. Of course, there are no recent great thresholds, no preset. Uh, so you can get an A with lower numbers than what you're used to. And as I said, you know, I want to make your life this semester miserable rather than doing your GTA going forward. Okay. Any questions? Okay, one more thing. Other quote. As I already mentioned, I assume it's, I mean, I'll show this to all my classes, but this is an honors college yeah, students. The word honor is there, the thing. So how many of you, uh, know of the Harvey Mudd honor code. I mean, you may not know. It's, it's a strange code. Harvey Mudd is a college. It's a four-year college. Um, and they have this radical honor code. And you sign it, and once you sign it, you get to do timed exams in your dorm rooms with nobody looking at you. You understand what I'm saying? That's really what honor is, because in this day and age, everything that I can ask you about AI, you Google, you'll get the answer. <laughs> I'm saying. It's like you don't need to take this course. You can just basically Google and you'll get the answers for everything. The question is not that. The question is whether you know the answer. Whether you actually understand the concept or are you just basically being a GPT-3? How many people know what GPT-3 is? Don't be a GPT-3. Because GPT-3 is going to run your life anyway. Which is basically these large language models. You guys know that? And how many of you have heard other than so we'll talk about GPT-3. It's essentially a system that's been trained on all the text in the world. OK, so it tries to learn the patterns in all the text. It's like the world's best parent. So if you give it half a sentence, it will complete it. It can complete it into stories, it can complete it into paragraphs, it can complete anything. And the completions are interesting enough that people are impressed. Because they didn't think that Writing coherent English is that easy. It turns out that writing coherent English is easy. Now. Okay. Uh, but does GPT-3 quote unquote have any idea of what it is doing? No, it's essentially looking at what word would come next, given the words that have come before. And what's the word with the highest probability of coming next, given that I've seen the other words? It looks mind-blowing until you see it, but actually I can give you um, 
I can give you a link uh, where you can try out. You know, for example, for those of you who haven't heard of GPT-3, you can write any random thing, a uh, passage, and you continue the message. It's become like a big deal now. People are using it for all sorts of things, which actually brings up the question, something that we will talk about during the semester quite a lot, is what is intelligence? You know, is GPT-3 intelligent, for example? You know, it's very useful for certain things. You know, if you want to write an essay for a teacher who doesn't read the essay, I just want to make sure that it's some number of pages and it looks like it's in English. Why waste your time? Ask GPT-3 to do it. And then that teacher will have their own GPT-3, which will grade your essay. We can all have fun using this My point coming back, it is that I know that you can produce answers by Googling. I assume that you're intelligent enough to do that. Okay. I always said that integrity is knowing that you can cheat, but choosing not to. That's what integrity is. If you don't even know that you can cheat, basically you have a smaller brain. Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? In fact, we lie, we cheat. That's part of being human. The ability to lie is a, a form of intelligence. Another time, another thing that I keep saying is that to be able to lie, for example, you need to realize that what you believe is different from what others believe. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when kids come into this world in the beginning, they sort of think that they are connected to the entire world. Their body and the rest of the world, there's no difference. At least this is what you know the studies tell us. After a while, they realize that they have a different body from the rest of the world. But they still tend to think for quite a while that what they know is also known to others. And for a while, actually, after that, they'll think that whatever they like is what everybody else likes. That means everybody has the same preferences. Before, everybody has the same body. Next, they think that everybody has the same preferences. Imagine a world everybody has the same exact preferences. It'll be very hard to find a mate. Right? Because if everybody likes the same thing, then it doesn't make any sense. The world doesn't work. It turns out they'll realize, eh, hey, I don't need to worry. Everybody seems to have different preferences. I like bananas, they like tomatoes, that's fine. And later they realize, and for a while they still tend to believe that they whatever they believe, other people believe. Whatever they know, others know. And there's actually a beautiful experiment that sets that um, that's called Sally and Experiment. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, look it up later. But Sally and experiment, what it does is uh, make a small digression, but it's one digression. So it's basically you're seeing this experiment in progress. You could be a big kid like you or a really small kid, like a three-year-old. And the experiment basically shows that Sally comes into the room, takes a ball, puts it into the red box, and goes out. And comes into the room takes the ball from the red box, puts it into the yellow box, goes out. Now Sally comes into the room. Now the question for you, the listeners, for the observers, where would Sally look for the ball? Those of you who are having trouble with this are certainly don't actually yet realize that you can lie. You understand what I'm saying? Because the point is that it's for us, for all of us, this is obvious. Obviously, Sally will look for the ball in the box she put it. The fact that you know that Anne put the ball in a different box is not known to Sally. States of knowledge. If all of us have the same knowledge, we can't lie. And you might say, that would be a great word. That would also be a really, really boring word. You understand what I'm saying? So I assume that ability to lie, cheat, deceive, they're all great signs of intelligence. But in this class, you choose not to use them. That's what integrity is. Okay? So that's basically the other core business. I just want to mention it once and one. Um, I, you should assume that we'll know how people try to cheat and we, we might well be checking. But I'm not, in the beginning at least, I'm going to hope that, you know, why would anybody take this class as against a nice, uh, easier class? I'm assuming that you don't want to do that. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. I think you're going to have to do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah
know you're saying like you can't like look stuff up on the web, but if I have a question about like something I'm trying to do in Python or something like that, is it fine for me to look? Mostly, up? yeah. I mean, again, there is this. One of my colleagues basically says uses this thing called reasonable person principle. Okay, I mean, you you kind of know when you're asking that whether or not it's reasonable. You know, most of us have a sense that okay, how to do Python is not this, what this course is about. Figuring out how to write the program construct is fine. Picking up the code somebody else has is not the point. It's not mine. I mean, you all know. I mean, it's not that you have got you know just fell out the coding part. And you all know exactly how the world works. And you try to essentially some you know people try to misuse the system, but I'm hoping we won't. Okay. Any that's basically my short introduction to the administrative part of the course. Any questions on that before we go forward? Yes. So what kind of models are we going to be learning about and working with? What does it mean? Um, like. Um, are we going to be doing supervised or unsupervised more so? <laughs> okay. That's a very good question. And I hope, and at least I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. Okay. Uh, the question is, are we doing unsupervised or supervised models? You know, one of the things about AI is, you know, as I told you, I have been teaching it for 30 years. Okay. Before, I would actually have a, like a zing-bang movie trying to get people excited about AI. I'm not showing it. I'll give you a link. You can watch it yourself. I mean, I just spent a lot of time before videos were almost invented to put together this video to kind of excite people. I think it's unnecessary because you're not excited about AI. And what else is there right now in the world? But the flip side of it is everybody thinks that they already know what AI is. You know what I'm saying? If you take some course on like distributed databases, it's very unlikely that you think you know what distributed databases are or all about. But with AI, because of the saturation coverage everywhere, in all walks of life, you, you see it about New York Times, you see it in all the papers, you see it in the radios. You know, there are there's a country, United Arab Emirates, which has a minister for AI. We are falling behind in the race. Okay. So, given that level of his actual coverage, one problem, of course, is people have um, made up their mind as to what AI is. Okay. The question that this gentleman is asking is basically about a very specific part, which is how to learn a concept given examples, which turns out is not the only thing that we do in this course. Okay. But we will talk about this. We should keep that in mind. But it's not about today I'll do supervised learning, tomorrow I'll do unsupervised learning, day after tomorrow I'll do reinforcement learning, we're done. OK? And it's also not about today I will give you a four layer neural network, tomorrow I'll give you 18 layer neural network, and we're done. Is that? But please feel free to ask, because I assume if random people on the road have preconceived notions about AI, smart folks like you probably have even more. Some of them may be right, some of them may be wrong. And I won't know unless you ask. Any other question? Yes? I've heard people talk about the intro to ML class as well. What? The intro to machine learning class as well. Uh -huh. so how would this class be significantly different from that one? That's what you will find out, basically, as part of the Basically, learning is one part of being intelligent. As we'll see in a minute. The course, if you have to say what AI, intro to AI course is about, it is about designing intelligent agents. That's all. How you design them, there are different, different ways. One piece, typically most intelligent agents wind up doing is learning. Another piece is planning. Another piece is reasoning about other people's mental models. You understand what I'm saying? You know, it's just there are many, many things that go on in showing intelligent behavior. Okay. Other questions? I mean, it will become clearer as today's class itself goes forward. Other questions? So far, so good. These are good questions, by the way. I mean, I don't even get these questions. Uh, that means that you have. So, in a weird way, it's more interesting for me to try to get you to understand what I think are the differences and why you should care about. 
the full picture. As a gainist, a huge number of one-off tutorials on the YouTube. Like you don't need, I mean, like everybody is an AI expert. In fact, my joke is that, that the demand for AI experts without any background in AI has never been greater. You too can join that demand. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like you become an AI expert by saying, ah, I'm an AI expert. Nobody becomes a physics expert by saying that. But you can become one for AI. In fact, look at LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn is the great uh, indicator of what's hot. Right? It's like, if you don't have AI in one of the passions, then you are conscious. Because who's going to look at your LinkedIn page? Okay, so it's there is that issue, and I'm hoping that you will get a better sense. So I think of increasingly, I think of teaching intro to AI is actually a public service. At least these 30 people will know it. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, that's basically the way I look at it. Other questions? Okay, so introduction to the course. So, we are going to do those things. Um, what is AI? AI success and expectations. What is involved in doing AI? Um, those are the things that I'll try to cover today. And then, if they cannot get to it, you know, we'll talk more again next week. Um, the the background, background readings for all these are in the textbook. The chapters one and two are the background reading for today's and part of next class. Okay. And also, the stuff that I made you read. How many of you have read? Remember the integrity part. Okay, so so if you read that, then a whole bunch of these questions will be, you know, some of these discussions will make sense. I don't want necessarily quiz you right now, but that also is part of the background material because you want to get a sense of what is and what is not um, part of the bigger picture. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I'm crazy about AI. You know, I was, like I say, I was crazy about AI before it was cool. In fact, my joke is that in the old days when I would say, I'm doing AI, people would feel sorry for me. And, oh, it looks like you don't know how to do software engineering. On databases. Okay. And they are all right now saying they are also doing AI. In fact, in the department, you go to any faculty member, they'll say they too are doing AI. Okay. Um, that's part of how fads go, but you know, I cared about it to some extent because there really are only three important questions left that we need to answer. Origin of the universe, origin of life, nature of intelligence. Yeah, it tries to get pathway towards nature of intelligence. Not necessarily how the brain works, but how can you show intelligent behavior? So how can you not be interested? You know what I'm saying? So in fact, I think that it requires a certain particularly bad teacher to make AI courses uninteresting. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it's like the subject is amazingly interesting. You know, whatever. to make databases interesting, just picking up something from the head, right? You need to be a really good teacher because the subject is boring. Not just for me, okay? But AI, come on. I mean, it's like you have to be really bad and add negative utility to the subject, just so that you will hate it. So that's me. Um, if I, you know, I don't know if I put this in one of the lists there, but it, like a while back, I had to give a university last lecture. And I gave a lecture, uh, connection between AI and life. And again, this is not required for the course, but you might enjoy looking at it. You know, especially as the course goes on, the connections I'm making, um, from the technical parts there, and the life will make a lot more sense. Okay. Okay, so that's about my background and AI. Um, so now, what's the goal of AI? The goal of AI is, here is basically the definition. Okay, for wishy-washy, namby-bamby definition. Okay, which is develop artificial artifacts that can show behavior which when shown by the humans, is considered intelligent. This is what I'm saying. You see the circularity here. What is beauty? Beauty is the 
beauty is if people think there is beauty, it is beauty. So it's circular definition. To some extent, this might mean that the definition, while is okay in a large sense, can also get you into all sorts of uh, all sorts of um, um, rabbit holes, and also wishful thinking. Okay, so let me tell you a joke. Okay, here's a joke. So, a, a mathematician, an engineer, and an AI guy were talking about what is the greatest invention humanity has ever made. Okay? Mathematician said zero. After all, I mean, after what I invented zero, without zero, there is no mathematics. It's like the greatest invention. So the second guy, the engineer said, the wheel. Look, I mean, even in the rock ages, in cave ages, people were making wheels. And the wheel was like the first big invention. Squares don't rotate well. Right? Inventing wheel, it's obvious that like, no one is a great thing. Everyone is a Looks like that's a great invention. Then the AI guy's chance came. The AI guy said, what is that? A thermostat. And everybody was surprised. What the heck? I mean, there's wheel, there's zero, and there's thermos flask. Why is thermos flask one of the greatest inventions of humanity? So what did the AI guy say? He said, look, if you pour hot water in the thermos flask, it will keep it hot. Yeah. If you pour cold water in the thermostat, it will keep it cold. Yeah? How does it know? It is intelligent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keep the thermos flask in the back of your mind. Whenever you think something is AI, does it pass the thermos flask test? You know what I'm saying? Because intelligence is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> right? And this basically, it's worth keeping. In fact, there is a, a beautiful. Um, a beautiful uh, metaphor in AI like this, uh, called the Simon's Ant. So what is Simon's Ant? Uh, Herbert Simon is one of the four people who was in this conference that was held in 1956 in Dartmouth. And they came up with the name artificial intelligence for the field. And they said, we will do it. OK, if you read about the history of AI, et cetera. You know, there is like no such history of uh, uh, other fields, maybe, but there is certainly history of AI. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Herbert Simon. Um, along with the other people there were Alan Newell, John McCarthy, and Marvin Minsky. Anyway, the names are not important. You will hear about them as they're considered like the founding founders of the field, quote unquote. Okay. But Albert Simon, essentially, is actually a very interesting character. He's the only guy with a Nobel Prize who was in a computer science department. How? It turns out that there was no such thing as AI. There was no such thing as CS before, when he was around. He was actually an organizational behavioral analyst. OK, and in fact, the word organizational behavior economics, you will see, is connected um, for things that we are hearing about. One of the things that hopefully we'll get to in this class today, maybe you have heard about it before, is do you know system one, system two? Have you ever heard of system one, system two in the brain? I'm not about it. OK, that comes from behavioral psychology. But anyway, Herbert Simon talked about this ant who's going on the 
on the beach. You're an observer. Well, looking here from Mars, you don't know anything about ants. Okay? So you're looking at that, and the ant basically is doing an extremely complex part. You would think, obviously, simplest things is going in a straight line. It's boring. But you see that ant is going like this, like this, like this. All sorts of crazy things. If you look at the paths of ants on, on the beach, they could be very complex. You can see that, right? So the question is, does that mean the ant is intelligent? Does it have a micro miniaturized micro miniaturized brain in its little head? No. It's a Roomba. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Ants are the world's original Roombas who can't suck as well. Right? What do ants do? They go until they hit something, they turn. That's what Roomba does. I mean, I mean, first of all, I know you all know Roomba, but you don't know Simon's ant. That shows the cultural decline. But that's a different story. Right? <laughs> but I mean, Roomba is basically a, a very simple agent. Right? It just essentially goes in a straight line until it hits something. So if a Roomba is in a room without any obstacles, you'll think it's not in it. If it is in a room with obstacles, and you're looking from above, it looks quite intelligent. And it seems to be doing a very complex part. And so what Simon was saying is, oftentimes, you can, a simple organism, in a complex environment might look more intelligent than it really is. You understand what I'm saying? Think about this. this there are analogies of this in your own life. Sometimes you think, somebody, wow, smart thing they did. And it may very well be that they are just responding to the environmental stimuli. And if I were to tell you, you wouldn't normally consider intelligence to be just responding to the environmental stimuli. How many of you think intelligence is just responding to the environmental stimuli? How many levels of intelligence? You would think that just responding to the stimuli is the lower level, planning ahead thinking about where future, how future would evolve, and trying to plan yourself in a, put yourself in a position such that you will do well in the, in the future. That is what really we tend to consider a higher level intelligence. Okay? It's not that responding to environment is useless, it is just that that's the lowest level of intelligence. So, not surprisingly, when I get to quote-unquote intelligent agent architectures, you will look at a first particular in architecture, which is called reflex agent architecture. What the reflex agent does is it looks at the environment and does something reflexively. And to write such an agent, maybe you have like a big table. It says, if you see this, do this. If you see this, do this. If you see this, do this. Ant is a reflexive agent. I mean, unless ants are keeping their intelligence hidden from me and they're writing ant books that I've not read. Um, it's a reflexive agent. It basically can be defined as keep going straight until you hit something. When you hit something, then turn. At least for its navigation. I mean, I mean I'm doing disservice to ants. I mean, there are people who study ants for their life. I'm hoping that we are a little better than ants. Right? Um, so keep that in mind in trying to think about what is what's the word is not intelligent. Uh, so in the textbook, actually, they try to summarize the various definitions of AI and what it's trying to do in terms of these four systems. And all of them sort of look reasonable. And the textbook basically sort of explains the differences and says, we will do the last one as our guiding definition. And I just want to quickly give you a sense of what that is. So systems that think like humans, systems that think rationally, Systems that act like humans, systems that act rationally. They all, almost sound similar, but there are obviously differences. If you think a little bit, you'll realize that a system which might be acting like a human might not be rational. 
acting like humans can be stupid because wake up humans are stupid how many of you know this if you <laughs> okay if you going i'm doing a variation on this thing right? if you are going to sai harbor tomorrow you going to take a flight okay you going to sai harbor and some enterprising guy basically is selling travel insurance there are two types of insurance travel insurance one which covers covid related problems on the plane okay covid related problems the second insurance says we'll cover all the problems on the plane which one do you think most people pick which one do you think you will pick there is significant research showing that people will fall for the vivid not the general they say oh my god covid i've been thinking about covid i have all sorts of problems let me just take the covid insurance it may very well be that they're actually equally priced it may well be that there are only five cents difference but people will fall for the vivid one this is extremely well known in behavioral psychology so much so that do you guys know economist the magazine For two years, I have written on the board, so that's the problem. Economist, the magazine. How many of you have heard of it? Okay. Economist is a great magazine. I mean, it's basically, of course, the word economist says it. They're aware of economics, and they're also aware of behavioral economics. Okay. So, if you look at economist, the way it sells its wares is, it says, uh, digital only. $40. Print only. $45. Digital plus print. $45. Right? You think, ooh, I mean, I didn't fall off the target track. I'm not going to buy the digital funds. See, just because it's the same as the print only. Economist knows their subscription went up when they did this. Even now they do it. Go look up. Because we fall for these kinds of things. We are not particularly rational. And in fact, there is an entire field whose existence depends on us not being rational. What is that field? Huh? What? Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, very interesting. Okay. No, uh, there's an entire field. Yes. No industry. Yes, see, no, yes, but even bigger. Yes. What? Marketing. I think here. Marketing. Marketing. Yes. Advertisements. Marketing. The entire advertisements depend on people being irrational. Not just irrational. They are predictably irrational. And they're so predictably irrational that they can use you. What is Facebook doing? What is Twitter doing? They know that we are essentially used to these dopamine, little, little dopamine shots. So anytime some light comes, you stop doing whatever you're doing, look at the Twitter. Anytime some other thing comes, you waste your time looking at the Facebook. These are all essentially all of advertisement, all of marketing completely works on exploiting your built-in behavioral irrationalities. Now you might ask, why did quote unquote, how did we evolve this way? Why did we evolve this way? It turns out that evolution didn't happen in the last year, not even 6,000 years back. Okay, I mean, at least in this class, we can't say it's, you know, that sort of nonsense. Okay, so over the long period where the evolution occurred, the problems that we were facing were very different from the problems we face today. We evolved, our behaviors evolved to deal with the problems we faced. Here is another example. If I say, oh 
my god, there's a tiger. What do people do? They run. Right? Did you ever, did you ever stop and think, what if the tiger is insulted by my running away from the tiger? Maybe the tiger wanted to say hello. How many of you have seen Calvin Hobbes, the strip, the, the, the cartoon strip? Maybe it's Hobbes. It's a good tiger. It just wanted to say hello to you. And you ran away. Hurting experience. Why did we do this? Because if you don't live, there is no story to tell. Now, let me change this. Instead of a tiger, think of it as like a guy like Rao. Very menacing brown guy. You have, for whatever reason, decided last time around a very menacing brown guy punched you. And uh, I don't want to deal with this sort of stuff. So you run away. I do have feelings. I feel bad. I'm a false positive to your studio time. Being a false positive is a task only the person who became the false positive will experience. It's good for you, rationally speaking, to run away. Because you thought, you know, most of the tigers seem to eat people. Why do I want to take a chance that this may be a good time? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, what we consider as behavioral idiosyncrasies of humans essentially evolved for possibly good reasons that no longer hold in the current world. And yet, we can't just change. And part of civilization is to grow over the evolution. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you basically learn to behave in ways that are not the most reflexively obvious things for you. Okay? Anyway, so the, the, I, I came to the whole thing because I said systems that act like humans don't necessarily have to be intelligent. Okay, um, and, and so basically you can make arguments about each of those, so let's go through quickly all of them. Um, so acting humanly is the first one I look at. Um, you guys know Turing, Alan Turing. Who have, how many of you know Alan Turing the name? The rest of you, look it up. Okay, I mean, if talking about Herbert Simon is important, Martin Misk is important, Turing is sort of the father of computer science. Okay, so you should look it up. But anyway, Turing, in addition to figuring out, you know, what does computing mean, what is the nature of computing in a mathematical sense, he was also thinking about, the first question he was thinking about is not how big an Excel spreadsheet can computers deal with. He was not a weeb like that. He instead was say, thinking, can machines think? So at the very beginning, when he had these room-sized machines that are about a million times less powerful than your cell phones, this guy and his friends were daring. They, they dared to think of, can machines think? So that's why he censored the father of AI too, in one sense. Now the question, of course, is, yeah, maybe they can think, but how will I know that they think? A scientist basically not only should say maybe this is possible, but should also have a test to check whether in fact that's the reason this happened. So he came up with the Turing test. And you, how many of you have heard of Turing test? Right? So again, one of these things is the number of hands that are going up is an indication of how widespread the AI has become. You know, back when I was teaching, yeah, nobody knows Turing test. Because the AI is just one small area, but now it's like you know, the huge fact. You want know, to figure out, but there's a good reason for facts. That's why the facts became facts. But not everything that is associated with the fact is actually defensive. And what we hope to do is to figure out which is which. Anyway, so um, he basically said, he put up this little thing. He said, humans will come and talk to something via a teletype, okay? And behind the screen, there is either an AI system, as a computer, or an actual human being. And they will start asking them questions. They basically start having conversation. This was a language-oriented 
best during this. Um, they are having conversation, and after some amount of time of conversation, then the humans interrogate vote and say whether they talk to a human or a machine. And if over a longer period of time, a machine was able to fool more than, let's say, 70% of the people into thinking it is human, then maybe it is intelligent. Do you, do you, do you see the argument here? So that was his idea. Okay, and Turing machine is a Turing test is still very much a part of um, AI uh, thing. People talk about it. People talk about why they should be better Turing tests and all that stuff. Um, in fact, one of the beautiful things is this guy wrote a paper called "Can Machines Think," where he anticipated all the major arguments about Turing tests. Most of them. That's why you talk about his name. He's a very smart guy. Uh, so, the problem, of course, there are all sorts of problems with uh, Turing test. It's not reproducible, it's not constructive, and it also cannot be analyzed mathematically. It's like, look, it looks like majority seem to think that this entity is human. The problem is, it tells you more about what we think is intelligence than what intelligence is. Okay? So, yeah, so the thing that is interesting about this, maybe I have it here. Actually, Turing test is so big. Dilbert, this was in 1999 or something. It's a Dilbert cartoon on Turing test. You can read it slowly, the slides will be there. So, it's become part of, uh, part of you know, folklore almost, uh, right? Uh, so, the question is, what are some of the problems with Turing test? One big problem basically is that it doesn't tell you about what is intelligence. So here's a great example that I'm aware of. There was a guy called Loebner um, who actually tried to set up a competition to win the annual competition. Loebner is not Turing. He's just a millionaire. Okay, and he just thought, hey, I'm going to set up a competition. Everybody likes, you know, Kaggle, right? So he was trying to set up like a Kaggle competition kind of a thing, because he years back. And he said, okay, you know, people, every year we'll hold this and we'll try to have, but to make it feasible, what we'll try to do is we'll have, instead of open-ended conversation, when you come, the thing on the other side says, I'm an expert on a topic. And then you can ask any general conversation in that topic. And the question then is, if you think it's human or machine. In fact, actually, right now, Turing test, this was all the thing that I'm telling you was from 19, late 1990s. Right now, you can put GPT-3 on the other side, and most people will fall for it. Because it sounds coherent. It sounds coherent, and one of the things of differentiating between coherence versus actually intelligent is much, much harder. My joke is, if you put anything in the old days when LaTeX was in, you know, basically the laser printing and LaTeX was invented, we would be just impressed because the paper is, is such nicely type, you know, typeset. So the handwritten paper looks bad. LaTeX paper already looks good. And we know this. That's why we kind of know that people always confuse syntax with content. That's one more of our problems. That's one more of the things that seem to have worked for us in evolution, which is why we still think people who look good to you, you tend to add other things to them, such as they're smart. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sure you're all very good and you don't do that, but so I'll admit that I have done that. You know, I remember going to this, you know, Indian classical dance performance once with a friend of mine who is herself a very accomplished dancer. So I'm sitting there and I was watching this dance going on and then there was this one lady I said was a particularly good dancer. So I looked at um, uh, Pinko, who is my friend, and told her, that lady is a very good dancer. She looked at me and said, you bozo, she's good looking, she's not a good dancer. This other lady, she's the good dancer. So I fall for it exactly the same way you fall for it. We all try to confuse syntax with semantics. 
So the question then is that can have a big issue, you know, these days. If you're talking to GPT-3, you don't know whether you're talking to GPT-3 or me. It becomes harder and harder to tell whether it is a human on the other side. Okay? What's more, what is more, at some point of time, if I answer every possible question you have on the topic, instead of making me look human, it might make me look machine-like. Because nobody is such a dweeb that they know everything about one single topic as if they have no other life. I'm hoping you'll all be like that for AI for the end of this semester. But in general, we assume that that's not how humans act. Right? Okay? So in fact, in the Lopner competition, there was this one example where this one guy said he was a, uh, he was a Shakespearean expert. He happens to be a, a human. So, but the people who passed through him didn't know that whether the machine or a human. Large number of people, about 70% of the people who talked to this guy were sure that he was a machine. He was a human, but they said, forget about machine making people think it is human. Here is a case of human making humans think it's a machine. Think about it. You do it all the time. You would do it too. If like some dweeb basically seems to know every possible little thing about a topic, I mean, you have no life or what? You can't be really human. You must have some gears. So, in fact, that guy basically, that, that actually happened in 1998. It will happen a lot more now because most of you will fall for talking to GPT-3. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you have seen the movie Goodwill Hunting? Okay. Remember the scene, I mean, you may not remember because I have seen that scene multiple times, where the Matt Damon character basically is yelling at this uh, math professor, saying, I don't know why the heck do you care about this math, it's just too damn easy for me, I do it and I can make it, and you are like, this math professor is dependent on Matt Damon to prove his theorems. And there's a beautiful point that Lambo, that the math professor makes, which is that really there are only about 20 people in the world who can tell the difference between you and me, you, Matt Damon, who is like a gifted mathematician, and me, Lambu, who is a great mathematician, but not the greatest mathematician. Only about 20% of the people. 20 people, not 20%. Can tell the difference between you and me. And he stops and says, unfortunately, I'm not. That's ultimately is the sad part, which is you can come to a point where we'll all be, we'll all be sounding like GPT-3 to somebody who doesn't quite know what to expect. And it's only for people who know enough about the topic, enough about all the intricacies of saying that thing, that particular concept, can they tell that, oh, this is superficial understanding. This is real Essay questions are hard to grade. You understand what I'm saying? By the way, GPT-3, we talked about GPT-3 so many times, but no, GPT-3 was such a fad that uh, Economist, the same damn uh, magazine, basically had an essay competition with people and they threw in a couple of essays on GPT-3. And the human judges scored it. And this, they did not say, oh my God, this looks like a machine writing. This was already three years back, okay? They didn't say it looks like a you know, machine. They just said, it looks like a mediocre story. Welcome to the world where you no longer need mediocre students because we have GPT-3. Why do we need people when you have a machine which can be just as mediocre as a mediocre student? So now to keep up with machines, you need to actually be higher intelligence. And when you show that, you may not necessarily be appreciated because the person looking at your essay has to also know enough about the topic to know the difference between some class and truly intelligent stuff. I mean, why it, what else does explain the fact that on the YouTube, any random person who dropped out of high school and actually doesn't know anything can put up a video explaining something, you know, some AI concept, and will tons of people say, look good, man. Because it all depends on who is listening. Okay? Anyway, so that's the problem with the uh, Turing test. Um, let me just complete one more piece and you can leave because we are, we are almost out of time. Um, by the way, you guys want captions. 
right? Captures are kind of connected to Turing test, which is basically trying to figure out whether you are a robot or a machine by asking you questions that only supposedly humans can do. The problem with captures is the more there is progress in AI, the harder it will be to tell the difference between people and machines. It's the same exact thing. At some point of time, they might have to say, capture, okay, show me the proof of some open math problem. Like maybe Play Institute, Millennium Math Problem. Because until then, like GPT-3 would have found it. If anything else, GPT-3 would have found it because it would have found it on the internet. How do I know that you're actually you? I'm obviously kidding, but you would notice that already things are becoming harder and harder and harder to do capture. I mean, you know, I don't know. For some reason, Hilton, Honors, yeah, honors, but Hilton Honors um, membership page, if I log in, it will make me do a bunch of things, like saying, you know, you must have seen this. It'll say, click all the pictures, uh, click all the squares of this picture that have traffic lines. How many of you have seen this stuff? Hilton, I do it. Hilton makes me do one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, like five, six times. I'm not sure whether they think that I'm not human enough, or they're just using me as free labor to label the data. I don't know which one. You know what I'm Capture is connected to um, AI part. Let me just point out the other two things and we'll get back to this later. Uh, quickly, I just want to say that thinking humanly is connected to cognitive science. It's just do you think the way humans think, not whether you act the way humans act. Because you can do the right actions for wrong reasons. And cognitive science thinks about that aspect. Thinking rationally is essentially loss of thought. I use logic. I use Bayesian reasoning to come up with my decision. And then finally, the thing that uh, he, they, they stick with is acting rationally. I don't really care why the machine acts rationally, whether it did because of the rational thought, whether it did because it acted like humans, whether it did because it thought like humans. But if its action is rational with respect to some performance metric, we'll talk about it next class. That is a good, a reasonable definition for going forward in defining, in defining um, intelligent agents. And let me just show one thing, and I know that uh, I'm already late, but let me just I'll cross all this, and I want to actually get you to the answer of one of the questions that somebody asked. What is AI? AI is figuring out these black holes. You have an agent that's looking at the environment, it gets some percepts, it has some effectors like hands, speech, you know, you know, whatever. So sensing, it has some sensors such as smell, hearing, etc. It has some effectors, okay? And it is trying to figure out what is the next action to, to maximize some performance. And we will figure out how to complete this black box in the next class. And the way you complete it essentially tells you what pieces you think are required for making an intelligent agent. OK? So, so when we come back next class, I will dwell a lot on this picture, which is a goal-based agent. It has a lot more small boxes. And then it turns out that you can make sense of everything that we do in this course in terms of that black box. That is the answer to what we'll write. Thank you.